All right, awesome. So uh, hi, everyone. First of all, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you about my research because I haven't had very many opportunities to share my latest results. Uh, my name is David Correa, and I'm a second year grad student from the University of Kansas, where I work in the KUXO lab led by Dr. Ian Crossfield. So as the title suggests, I'm going to be talking about stellar abundances, in particular isotopic carbon and oxygen abundances in dwarf stars, and kind of how they relate to both exoplanets and to galactic chemical evolution. So for a quick overview, I'm going to begin by discussing the isotopic carbon and oxygen ratios that I've measured in solar twin stars, as well as what, as well as, uh, what makes them the first measurements of their kind. Uh, second, I'm gonna go over the significance of these isotopic carbon and oxygen ratios and what they can tell us about planets, stellar and galactic chemical evolution. Uh, finally, I will talk about why we need more isotopic abundance measurements in dwarf stars and kind of go over my plans to build up this database. So um, on this slide, uh, you'll see the observed and model line profiles that I use to calculate abundances in this case in a sample of solar twins. I won't go into too much detail as to how I do it, but uh, just know that I have done it. And then I start by observing stars in the mid-infrared using I the iShell spectrograph at NASA's uh, infrared telescope facility. Uh, Matt and Sierra mentioned earlier that iShell gives us a high spectral resolution of about 70,000 or about 60,000 in the M band, which is where I'm observing at. And this is super important to resolve the carbon monoxide lines I'm interested in at a good signal to noise ratio. So uh, the reason we observe in uh, the mid infrared is because the M band gives us access to the CO rho vibrational band located at around 4.6 to 4.7 microns. And here there are about 100 different lines from the three main carbon monoxide isotop logs, uh, 12 CO, 13 CO, and C18 O. Uh, overall, having access to spectral features from molecules that carry 12 C, 13 C, 16 O, and 18 O, it's really important because this allows me to measure both the isotopic carbon and the oxygen ratio from one spectral region. Uh, there's a recent study led by uh, Rafael Botello that measured the isotopic carbon ratio in a sample of about 63 solar twins using optical CH features. But uh, because CH is not an oxygen bearing species, we can't get the oxygen ratio using this method. So this means that my ox isotopic oxygen measurements are the first of their kind in solar twin stars and uh, kind of dwarf G, K, and M stars in general. Um, so here you're kind of looking at uh, the results from these calculations of my solar twin isotopic abundance measurements, and they are compared to predictions from several galactic chemical evolution models. So I have carbon here on the left and oxygen on the right. Um, so each model uh, uses a unique set of nucleosynthetic yields to predict the evolution of the isotopic carbon and oxygen ratios across time. Uh, you'll notice that these models do a pretty good job of reproducing uh, of reproducing uh, solar measurements. Um, so as well as my solar twin measurements, as you can see in the red points. Uh, I also have a bunch of gray dots that are the isotopic carbon measurements from Rafael Batelho's uh, solar twin study that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we don't see any other points on the oxygen plots uh, however, because there aren't any ox isotopic oxygen ratios measured in any dwarf stars other than my own. So at the moment, GCE models suffer from a lack of isotopic carbon and oxygen measurements in nearby dwarf stars, but uh, we'll talk about how much we're la lacking later on. Um, overall, uh, I'd like you to understand that it's important to identify discrepancies between stellar abundances and measurements made in the interstellar medium and the galaxy as a whole. Uh, because doing so allows us to investigate whether GCE models are uh, using inaccurate nucleosynthetic yields that don't quite reproduce observed abundance ratios, or whether our observations are anomalous and there's something else going on that we need to look a little bit deeper into. Um, so now we'll talk about what makes the isotopic carbon ratio so important to stellar and galactic chemical evolution and even planet formation. 
So first of all, the isotopic carbon ratio is used to study internal mixing processes and stellar evolution in massive evolved stars where most uh, carbon is produced. Also, because the carbon ratio doesn't change too much over the lifetime of the dwarf stars I'm interested in, it can actually be used to chemically characterize the stellar parent clusters. There was a recent study back in 2018, I believe, led by Varda and Adebekian uh, that even used the isotopic carbon ratio in their search for the sun's siblings. Uh, so for these reasons, it's important to build up the database of isotopic abundance ratio so we can explore how they change over time, and in particular, how they correlate with the age of a star as seen in this top figure here. Um, the isotopic carbon ratio also tells us some pretty important stuff about planet formation. So if we take a look at this bottom figure here, we see the planets that form inside the CO snow line, which is about uh, 20 AU from the star and solar type stars. They tend to inherit the isotopic carbon ratio of their host star which is pretty close to that of the surrounding interstellar medium. However, in planets that form outside of the CO snow line, they're expected to have a much different isotopic ratio because they accrete the bulk of their carbon from ices that tend to be enriched in 13 carbon due to uh, isotopic fractionation. So measuring the carbon ratio can tell us about where uh, or how far from the star of the planet formed and this is why it's important to measure the isotopic carbon ratio in both stars and exoplanets because it gets us closer to answering planet formation questions, uh, kind of like those that Inga Kamp presented to us earlier. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about the isotopic oxygen ratio. Um, Andrew Linkowski from the Virtual Planetary Laboratory recently led a study that demonstrates that the isotopic oxygen ratio can act as a tracer for past ocean loss on terrestrial exoplanets. So if we look at this figure on the right from Vicky Meadows, also at the VPL, we see that a planet that has had its ocean evaporated uh, because of intense stellar radiation from its host star, it has tons of oxygen and ozone in its atmosphere. So in terms of isotopes, we expect to see lighter isotopes like uh, 16O in the atmosphere while heavier isotopes like 18O sink to the planet's surface. Um, and this results in a kind of like fractionation signature of past ocean loss that is likely to be observable with uh, James Webb from space as well as uh, ELTs from the ground. So it's important to remember that the isotopic oxygen ratio has yet to be measured in any dwarf stars other than in my solar twin sample, uh, let alone any exoplanet atmospheres, which is why it is so important to uh, start proposing these observations to help build an isotopic abundance database. Now, uh, thank you. Just so you get an idea of how badly we need dwarf star isotopic abundance measurements, I'll talk about what currently we have out there. In terms of G type dwarf stars, otherwise known as solar twins, there are about 65 stars with measured carbon ratios. And for oxygen ratios, again, we only have the six that I have measured. Uh, if we go down to K dwarfs, there's absolutely nothing, no carbon isotope ratios, no oxygen ratios. Um, going down to M dwarfs, um, there are only two stars with isotopic abundance measurements, and these M dwarfs have measurements of both the carbon and oxygen isotope ratio as performed by my advisor Ian Crossfield back in 2019. Uh, these M dwarf measurements are actually pretty cool because unlike solar twin measurements I've uh, mentioned so far, they don't quite agree with uh, galactic chemical evolution model predictions, which again is why we need a bigger database of isotopic abundances in order to see trends. Uh, finally, we have uh, Yapeng Zhang just last year reported the carbon isotope ratio measured in the atmosphere of a young super Jupiter. And this measurement is the first isotopic abundance measurement made in an exoplanet. So it's reassuring to see that those measurements can be made in both dwarf stars and even exoplanets. Um, so that brings me to my final point, which is ultimately that we need more isotopic abundances. Because we have so few existing measurements, it's super important to begin expanding this database, both to help uh, calibrate GCE models and to support James Webb and ELTs as they begin observing exoplanet atmospheres. So over the next couple of years, I will work to build up this isotopic abundance database. I plan to measure the, uh, the carbon ice and oxygen isotope ratios in TRAPPIST-1, whose seven exoplanets are prime targets for James Webb, 
uh, as well as uh, TYC8998, which is the host star of the Super Jupiter that I mentioned earlier with a carbon ratio measurement. Um, we'll also be looking at binary systems and moving group stars with well-known ages to determine the correlation between isotopic abundances and stellar age to see if isotopic abundances could be used to age a star, for example. And finally, I'll be performing these measurements in James Webb targeted exoplanet host stars to kind of keep exploring the link between exoplanet, stellar, and galactic abundances. Um, uh, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for listening. And please feel free to contact me via email if you want to talk about isotopic abundances. Um, and if you want to see another one of my talks and learn more about the work being done by early career exoplanet scientists, uh, you can visit NASA's Exoplanet Explorers page and you can use the QR code here to get you there. So I guess now um, I'll try and answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Let's see. So any questions for David? Again, please feel free to raise your hand on Zoom or ask your questions on Slack. So I guess I have a quick question about the models or the techniques that you use to measure um, sure. these isotopic ratios. Um, I don't know too much about this, but are they um, are they particularly complicated or um, like the ones that you you showed in some of your initial slides? I guess if you could tell us a little more about the models that you're using. Yeah, so in terms of making the actual measurements in these stars themselves, uh, I wouldn't say it's too complicated. So because there are so many lines to choose from in the spectral regime, I just uh, pick the strongest lines and the ones that aren't obscured by tellurics or overshadowed by stronger absorption lines, uh, stack them together. And then it's like a spectral synthesis technique. So I take models of different amounts of different abundances of carbon monoxide and kind of like compare the two to interpolate uh, how much uh, of a certain species we actually observe in the star. I see, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, I think we have yeah question from Abby. So yeah, Abby, if you have a quick question, uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for a nice talk. I was just wondering, um, is there any, I'm, I'm just trying to think about the linking between the exoplanets and the disks that they are coming from. So you mentioned that um, you observe in the mid-infrared because of the CO lines, and in particular, we could you could probe the protoplanetary disks um, using Matisse, and you would trace this transition. So I was just mm. wondering if there's any benefit to that, or is it do you really need just like the sensitivity of geodiversity to look at the exoplanet signatures or is, is there no like concrete way of joining the two kind of evolutionary phases together? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So um, I think I would say that there, that there are pretty significant differences in measuring uh, abundances in exoplanets versus in protoplanetary disks. Uh, I believe in protoplanetary disks, you have to do like far infrared measurements to see anything. Uh, but in exoplanets, we do kind of have to narrow in to the, the, that uh, 4.6, 4.7 microns, uh, because at other wavelengths, we uh, kind of start to get overshadowed by absorption from other molecules and other species that might be in these exoplanets, uh, exoplanet atmospheres. Um, I, yeah, I hope that answered your question a little bit. Mm 